Good morning. It's still morning. Um, Shorburi and I are obviously delighted with this venue and delighted that we have a festival from TOI happening in Kolkata because uh, we've obviously, um, you know, we have our fair share of literary festivals, but it's always nice to have TOI pitch in. Um, it's a little early in the day and we are going to talk about something that has always been seen as a niche. And that is the art form known as the short story. So um, before we kind of start um, and before we delve into uh, Sharburi's work a little bit more, um, Sharburi, what is a short story to you? Well, when I, um, when I was first starting out, um, you know, I told my parents I want to be a writer and they said they were very excited because they're Bengali, <laughs> but they said, you still have to get your master's. So, so I was studying um, at New York University and I was getting my MFA in creative writing. And you know, you, we had to produce work pretty regularly. And most everybody was working on novels, you know, the novels in progress and novels. And I wasn't quite there yet. You know, for me a novel seemed like a gargantuan task and I, and I was young and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sure-footed. And so I wrote, short stories to fulfill my assignments. And it was, for me, a short story initially was craft exercises to see how economically I could tell a complete story. when you know, I've spoken to other writers, um, there's an interesting um, comparison that emerges. A lot of people have described the novel as a painting, like, like you know, an oil painting, whereas a short story is a sketch. And they're essentially both complete, but complete in different ways. Would you agree? Well, you know, a sketch implies an early draft of something, and I don't think that's accurate. I have read short stories that are profoundly more satisfying than very long novels, you know? So um, I, I, I think that it's, a, it's, a, it's pointillism as opposed to broad strokes. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great, great. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, you've, you've done such a variety of work since that, you know, since your first description of your first attempt at, at short stories, which obviously was successful. You've uh, converted one of your short stories into plays, you, you've had a novel, you've been a screenwriter, and all of these, you know, different genres, different forms of writing, they're all, I'm sure they're all different from each other, from an author's perspective. So could you take us through how different they are and, and you know, what's, what to you is the critical difference? between, let's say, how you would treat a novel, or which idea you would treat a novel as, uh, uh, you know, or which idea you'd take on as a play. Right. So how do you go about deciding that? Well, um, so I wrote this short story called Raisins, Not Virgins. <laughs> and I wrote it because I was trying to figure out a film. You know, I wanted to write a film. And I didn't... And I knew that I had to work on the characters and I had to work on the story and I really had to flesh it out. So I first wrote a short story I, as an exercise because I feel like it's a really wonderful way to kind of figure out, to find characters, find plots, find stories. And it ended up being a really fully realized short story and even won an award. You know, so I was like, it was my first award and my last one <laughs> ever. And um, so then, but it, since it was always meant to be a play, I was then able, because I found some of the things I needed to find in that short story, I was able to expand it into a play. And um, so it just, a lot of short stories lend itself to that. Now the play was much more expansive, of course. I was able to take some of the ideas that were in the short story and really build them out. I was able to add characters um, that I wasn't, I didn't have the um, opportunity to add in the short story. Um, so the play is mostly dialogue, <laughs> you 
you know, and a lot of choreography. And the short story is, you know, it's essentially fiction, uh, prose, where you can't rely heavily on dialogue because then, you know, unless it's really engaging dialogue um, that moves the narrative forward. Um, I also then turned Raisins on Virgins into a screenplay. And that was all, then another iteration, and that was even more different because that was more visual. So, it, so this particular short story had these three lives and these three iterations, so it's interesting that it's like an exercise on what you can do with a short story. You can do anything. And there's so many movies that have come from short stories, like Brokeback Mountain is a short story that was written by Annie Pruel, and it's by, of the same title. Um, In the Bedroom is another, if you've never seen it, it was more of an independent film. That is a short story from, And I think it's Andre Dubus, um, the third. Uh, John Updike's short stories have been made into films. I mean, Alice Munro's, Margaret Atwood, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think more recently for some of us who are sitting here, I think Kahani, this yes. Hindi film, and that's from a short story. That's from a short story. And, uh, yeah, that's Vidya, uh, is that Vidya Balan? With Vidya yeah, Balan, Balan in yeah, it. Yeah. It was quite, uh, oh, I didn't know it was that. very I'm, interesting. I, I want to read that short uh, story then. Uh, I think it's by a writer called Advaita Kala. Okay. And which brings me to my next point. I mean, there you were with this collection of short stories called The Ocean of Mrs. Nagai. Yeah. And uh, that was your, your MFA work in many ways, 15 yes, years. It was. And out of that, you, you had another, you know, Raisins Not Virgins became a play. But for the longest time, it was not published in India. It was probably, but yet now, yeah. we see that the collection is out. Yeah. So do you think, therefore, I mean, do you think there is a resurgence of the short story coming into being? Um, in your view, do you see this? generally as a pattern among publishers approaching authors saying, you know, we'd be looking for shorter formats? You know, this is a very funny question because every time I try to push another collection or talk about short stories, I'm met with by both American and Indian agents and publishers, oh, short stories don't sell, collections don't sell. And I'm, and I'm going to say that's not true. And is this even after Alice Munro got the Nobel? Yes. I mean, yeah. so and Jhumpa Lahiri won the Pulitzer for her short story collection. And people are still saying short stories don't sell. I don't get it. I really don't. I, I wonder if this is just a bunch of nonsense that publishers and agents feed the public and, f and sort of push around each other because it's convenient, because they don't want to contemplate it. You know, it's ultimately publishing is a business. So are, they may be thinking it, there's no money in it or something, and they're not. And I find that, and the conventional wisdom is such, you know. As, as for resurgence, I don't think it ever left, you know. I think it's always been there. I think it's underestimated. As I was telling, you know, some people right before I got on stage, I, when I go to bookstores in the U.S., I always see somebody, almost always see somebody with a short story collection in their hand, perusing it. Whether they buy it or not, they're definitely curious. Interestingly, um, I always felt that as uh, our mobile phones and our handhelds became more and more common, yeah, it, um, lends to that. it lends itself extremely Absolutely. well, short stories and I think poetry, Absolutely. both of them, because you, know, you can dip in, you can really immerse yourself for a while, yeah. and then your bus ride is over or whatever, and you're done, but you've fed yourself you with complete something. complete a story. You've completed the story. Which you wouldn't in a novel. Which you wouldn't in a novel. So would you say um, that publishers <coughs> perhaps need to look at technology more creatively yeah. to leverage it? Uh, because authors like to write all sorts of things. Yeah. And they like to make money from all sorts of writing. Right. So uh, I'd like you to comment on that, actually. Yeah, I definitely. Well, I mean, like anything. I mean, I look at established businesses like public, the publishing industry in Hollywood, the film, they always seem two or three steps behind the public. I don't know if you've noticed that. You know, trends, they're always just a little bit behind and they think that they're at the forefront. But they have so much money and so much access and resource, but they're always just a little bit behind. I don't think publishing is different from Hollywood in that sense. It's like, you know, I was, I, you know, I live in a town in the U.S. that's very close to New York City and many, it's a commuting town. Many people commute into the city. And I see people, and they're reading short stories. It's much easier. They, it takes them out of the fact that they have to go to their job, and that they have this long commute. 
and, and the story is completed. So yeah, I think that technology is, I think Amazon is, is selling, is, do, is, is sort of doing things like this where they're encouraging writers, aspiring writers to write short stories that are strictly for the digital platform. You know, but most, most publishing uh, institutions are not. So you know, behalf of Sharbri, I'm going to ask her the obvious question. Quantical happened. Yeah. Um, how did it happen? I mean, one sees the success, one sees the, you know, you've done almost every kind of writing, and you've made your mark in, in all, of your, uh, all of your forays. Um, and of course, one sees the success, and it's really nice to see, but I'm sure there's struggle behind it. I'm yes. sure there's sweat behind yes. it. So what was your journey? Well, there's still struggle and sweat. You have to understand that I'm writing, I, I'm American, Bengali, and I'm an American writer. I'm considered, I consider myself an American writer of Bengali heritage. In the US, I'm looked at as exotic. And I'm not exotic, you know? And so the struggle that I'm feeling, that I still feel, and many of my fellow South Asian American writers are struggling with, especially the women, by the way, the, we, we have to also point that out, is that we're othered a good deal. We're stuck in this separate category a good deal. Um, and we are expected to write about saris and turmeric and mangoes and arranged marriages, all, hope, you know, luck, hopefully all in one story. It's nonsense, you know? If our, if our books don't have the title, have the word mango in it, it's not gonna, I mean, th this is- Or a certain kind of cover. A certain way, you know, yeah. It's very, very frustrating, this exotification. So I'm struggling, I've been struggling with that on top of the normal amount of rejection <laughs> that are any writer faces, you know, who's not co well connected or, established, you know? So the struggle has been, you know, rejection, lots of rejection, uh, and even people telling me, you're not talented, you shouldn't be writing. People say things like that, and they feel no compunction to talk like that to women, I've noticed. I, I, so, I agree. Yeah, <laughs> so, so you, have to, you have to really um, drown out these voices, and you have to keep going and uh, tenacity is, is the key and things, and you have to create, you have to create content, you have to create work, you have to create the foundation, the edifice, whatever, you have to create things. Quantico happened because I was creating things and they found me. If I, if I wasn't working, if I wasn't constantly creating and putting things out there and putting myself out, putting myself out there, they would never would have found me and I wouldn't have been hired and I wouldn't have had this extraordinary opportunity. So that's the, that's the lesson behind that, for sure. How crucial would you say your MFA uh, was in giving you the technical skills to be a writer? You know, some of us, myself included, I decided one day I wanted to be a writer and started writing a story. I had no, I thought I was starting with a short story. Didn't know what I jumped into. And you know, you, you, you don't really have that know-how when you kind of start something like that. But I you feel like went I through a course, and did that help? Did of that course, it did. But the thing is, I have to emphasize, MFAs are very expensive, and if you could avoid getting one, you should, because because as write writers are rarely rich, <laughs> I'm still paying off my student loan after God knows how long, you know. So, but I, for me, it was necessary because I didn't have the technical skill, and I didn't have. Uh, I was very young, and I knew I wanted to be a writer. And I think I had some basic storytelling ability, but you know, I, I, the craft aspect of it, I was not sophisticated. So I needed that MFA. MFA is a luxury. You know, you s I spent two years at NYU just working on craft, and that is an incredible luxury. It's, it's an amazing opportunity. But a, a person who instinctively knows how to write will be able to do so without an MFA. <laughs> Yes, I think in India, the, the standard route is you, you become a copywriter, you go into advertising, you become a journalist, and you, you know, sharpen your writing yes, skills. It's and, much and more you practical. Paid, and, you, and, and, you and you get, get paid. paid. Yeah. You get paid to learn, basically. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that, all of you call college people out there, yeah. pr pretty much, you know, if you're thinking thing about is, becoming a writer. Another thing is I'll say is, if you want to be a doctor, you go to medical school. You want to be a writer? What I did is I read War and Peace. <laughs> I read it a lot for the technical aspects of it. I treated it like a textbook because I wanted to see how Dostoevsky managed to hold multiple threads simultaneously because that was a feat. It was almost like an acrobatic feat, how he kept 
things that he, I, I, I found out his outlining process, it's like a textbook. It was like I created my own classroom. That's what you have to do. It was his web of probably 15 short stories, you know, yes. instead of one novel, which is separate. And he wove so them the together. complexity is immense. Yeah, and he wove them together seamlessly. It ta that takes skill. I wanted to see how he did it. Amazing, amazing. Um, could you read us something from your collection? We'd really love to. Uh, well, love to. So, you know, they say the short story is dead and whatnot, but I had three separate short stories published this year alone in three journals in the United States, two of which have rejected me multiple times over the years and finally accepted my short stories. So that was very thrilling. Another, another um, testament to uh, tenacity and perseverance. But this story um, was set it, in Bangladesh and it was published in Painted Bride Quarterly, a journal that is very well known and, and rejected me several times. And this is uh, about a young woman a little, rather, a little girl's encounter with a djinn. <laughs> it's called Noor, Embers, and Ash. In my grandmother's village in Silet stood a gnarled banyan from the ficus family with warty knobs and a 35-foot trunk that curved forward. To me, it looked like a dancer with a broken back. Its highest branches boasted wide green leaves that shivered and hissed with the wind. Its lowest branches were gray, dry, and devoid of leaves. Its aerial roots formed a forest that spread over an acre, all because a fig-eating bird had dropped a seed on the ground. I was told it was something to be avoided, like so many things girl children needed to avoid. The summer I turned 13, I decided to ignore the warnings. It was 1984. I traveled with my parents from Larchmont, New York, to visit my grandmother in Bangladesh. It was lush and green around the cluster of houses in which various family members were distributed. There was a pond fed by a modest creek near the center that had crumbling mossy steps leading down to the water. They were built so long ago that no one knew exactly when they had been placed there. The water, once pristine, was now coated with thick algae, amidst which pale pink water lilies floated. Just 30 years before, people bathed in the water and sometimes fished from it. Now it was too polluted, though some children took dips every now and again to combat the brutal summer heat and were re rewarded with stinging rashes for it. The village was at the foot of a small hill, terraced with untended plants. It was part of the acreage of an old British plantation. That plantation master's dock bungalow had fallen to ruin, but we were allowed to play in its shell after being warned of scorpions, snakes, and ghosts. The tree was haunted, they said, by one of its kansamas. There were many such caretakers since it was first built in 1896. And I was rewarned about the tree by various aunts. Don't take its shade. Anyone who touches its trunks, anyone who touches its trunk will break out in tumors on their face. Anyone who sits at the base and leans against it will be snatched away by the jinn who inhabits it, especially at twilight, especially if you are a girl over 12, and especially if your hair is loose, wild, and long. Why over 12, I asked one aunt because that is when you're walking into womanhood. I looked down at my flat chest. Nothing seemed to be happening to help my journey along, not even a period. I had the body of an ungainly boy, but I had hair that was long and mostly went unbrushed. It could be described as wild. Would you like me to continue? I'm just doing my wife. <laughs> I know. I don't want to be caught by Jen. <laughs> Would you like Shabri to continue? <laughs> Do you want me to keep uh, reading? Yeah, a little please, bit? a little okay. bit more, yeah. Okay. The hangings only added to the tree's morbidity. Two girls my age, the winter before, had been found hanging from it early one morning as the azan for prayer was called. There were f they were from this tree. They were sisters, age 13 and 12, skinny, barefoot creatures in torn kurtas. The branch they chose was high. It was impossible they climbed that high without assistance, but there they were, swaying, the strangest of fruit. I overheard my aunt tell my mother that no one wanted to climb up the tree to cut them down, so the little girls dangled there for nearly 10 hours while people argued. Even the police refused to go near the tree. Finally, the local vagrant Bachu, who some, were con who some were convinced was possessed himself, was paid 500 taka to tie his mud-caked lungi like a dhuti and shimmy, shimmy up the tree to cut them down. The villagers were desperate. 
because the bodies had started to smell, attracting cow crows and vultures and rats. My cousin, a morose girl of 16 who was very beautiful and well-developed, which prompted her mother, my, sister, my mother's sister to force her into a hijab at 14, told me that the moment the bodies were cut down, they were taken to the village mosque, where they were washed and wrapped tightly in white winding cloth and lain under the tree in the shade, side by side. In the cloth, they looked so slight, like dolls. <laughs> so, um, Shabri, that was immense, it was yeah. fantastic. Um, tell me, the shortest of short stories uh, that gets talked about, microfiction. Have you ever considered writing microfiction? I've tried and I've failed miserably. I'm no good at microfiction, but I'm going to try because I think it's yet another opportunity to sharpen craft. You know. So how many words would you say your microfiction, I mean, what, what's your definition of microfiction? 600 words, 500? 600, I think 1,000. Some are, so I've seen some calls for microfiction that are 300 words. Yeah, so, you know, Twitter being, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there used to be this Twitter microfiction contest, but I, 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 I tried my hand, like many people, yeah. and eventually found it a little bit, well, unsatisfying, because it's just so much you can talk about it. There's a certain length under which it's very difficult, I think, to tell even a simple story. Well, I think, have you heard of that, oh God, I'm going to get it wrong, that Ernest Hemingway story? Um, baby shoes. shoes. Uh, uh, so, uh, for baby sale, shoes, baby shoes, shoes never sale. worn. Baby yeah. shoes for sale, never worn. Never worn, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that, I always think about that, you know. And Raymond Carver, who is an author I <coughs> also studied, like I did Dostoevsky, because Raymond Carver is the master of um, telling incredibly, you know, expansive stories, uni uni you know, universes, containing universes in, a, in, you know, in short stories. So he does that as well. He's able to sort of uh, communicate incredibly large stories of inner lives in, in a very short amount of time. So is your novel, uh, dust, un dust Under Her Feet, I mean, is, is it out at the same time, same publishers, Westland? No, it's a d yeah, it's Westland, but my short story collection was published by <coughs> some another company. And yeah, Westland, it, my novel, <laughs> that's 400 pages long. So it's the op polar <laughs> opposite of a short story. Um, <coughs> it just came out in August, and it's set in Kolkata. Oh, um, could you tell us a bit about it? I mean, I know it's not uh, short stories, <laughs> and it's not the topic, but since we are discussing but your you work... you know, it, it actually was inspired by a short story I wrote, right. The Ocean of Mrs. Nagai. So, um, The Ocean of Mrs. Nagai is, the, is a short story I wrote that was about a Japanese war widow who, um, you know, it's about a young couple, Bangladeshi woman married to an American man who traveled to Tokyo, and they meet Mrs. Nagai, whose husband had <coughs> overseen a prisoner of war camp during the war. And it's about that story. And I was doing research for this short story. And I actually did a lot of research just to really get this, the authenticity of the time period down. And as a result, that inspired me to write Dust Under Her Feet, which is set in Kolkata in the 1940s. And it's about the American military presence in Kolkata, the soldiers who were on their way to fight in Burma. I had no idea, but the Americans took over Kolkata for a couple of years. And it was uh, astonishing how, <laughs> how quickly they sort of <coughs> absorbed themselves into, th into the town, and much to the chagrin of the British. So how do you do your research, whether for a short story or a novel? I mean, how do you go about it? Well, for Dust Under Her Feet, I actually came to Kolkata, and I had to sort of, I went to the National Library, and I read all the archi archived newspapers, and I, you know, I really found out about what, what the local people of Kolkata, how they dealt with the, the incessant bombing from the Japanese during uh, the winter of 1941-42. And, um, and I read a ton of books, and, um, but being in Kolkata was important. I walked down Park Street where I set the majority of the action, and I sort of imbibed the environment. I mean, Kolkata is, uh, is an old place, and it, at that time, which was a decade ago, there were still a lot of heritage buildings around, and, you know, so that's how I Sadly did a lot missing. Of I oh, know, yeah, yeah. <coughs> I know, that broke my heart, actually, yeah. when I was noticing that. Yeah, we don't seem to understand <laughs> why, why we should hang on to our heritage buildings and look after them. We, do, we don't get it, I, I wonder why. Um, 
So what next for Shahbury Zahra Ahmed? What comes next? Well, one of the things many people have said is that Dust Under Her Feet is particularly cinematic. And I've been encouraged to write the screenplay version. So I'm working on that. I've started my second novel. And that's about 80,000 words into it. And I'm going to keep this one as short as I possibly can. <laughs> and, um, and my play, actually, Raisins on Virgins, is having a revival and will be produced off-Broadway in New York in 2020. Well, <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> and uh, uh, so much for the voices that you have clearly successfully managed to drown out. Um, having lived and worked a little bit in the US, I mean, I'm fairly certain I can vouch for the fact that you really are, you know, a minority of a minority as a woman from an ethnic minority community of any kind. Um, so congratulations, Shadbury, on being such an inspiration. Questions from the audience, please. We have mics, I'm sure we can send across. Um, if you've been thinking of asking Sharbury any questions, if you'd like her to read from her novel a bit, she is here. We have time. We have 15 minutes to go at the very least. Somebody has a question back there. Brilliant. I would appreciate if you could state a few journals or publications where you can send short stories to get them published or try to get them published. Well, in the US, there's a lot. I mean, there's, there's, and you have to understand there's tiers of journals, you know? The journals that pay, and there are, believe it or not, journals that pay, um, those are much more competitive to get into, but say, uh, you know, the New Yorker, that's you know top tier. That's very difficult to get into. They pay. Usually, they want your agent to send work. Um, New England Review, which my latest short story got into. I really they're difficult to get into, but if when they do accept you, they're very good editors. Um, if you you know you really all you have to do is you have to Google literary journals in the U.S. and and you know I think they would welcome international work. I, some of them the top. The, the really good ones welcome international work. So I would just Google and find out the submission guidelines and send in. So I should uh, search for literary journals, is that it? Yeah, l literary journals, yeah, not just journals, yeah. Fair, thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> okay, uh, anybody else? No one? I think they are amazed, actually. We are actually, we are amazed. <laughs> Would you um, like to know a little bit about Dust Under Her Feet? I mean, Shorbury is here, if you wish, <laughs> wanted to read a bit. I could read, I guess. Okay. <coughs> Did I bring it? I don't if, know if, if I you have. <laughs> or if your phone has a bit, we don't mind. I don't, my phone, I don't think I brought it. <laughs> but it's, it's, um, it's available at the bookstore here. My agent was very upset because in Delhi, it, it not enough copies sold, but I, th I said, don't worry, in Kolkata it's going to sell because the story is about Kolkata and it's about Bengalis. You know, the thing about the story is it's that... It's a fascinating time in Bengal's history. Yeah, I mean, well, not just in India's history, but also Bengal's history. Absolutely, because, so, you know, I do discuss a pretty awful day that happened in 1946 called Direct Action Day in Kolkata when the communal violence between Hindus and Muslims became absolutely murder. It was horrendous. It was one of the worst acts of communal violence in, in the history of the world. And a lot of people don't know about it because a lot of the violence of partition is focused in Punjab, right? They're not thinking about Bengals, you know. And in doing research, I also discovered just how strong the Bengalis were in agitating to get the British out. Mm. Um, and, and we have been for a very long time. I mean, we, we were amongst those who started, you know, the, in Chittagong, a decade prior to when my story was set, there was the uprising, Shud Joshen and Preeti Lata. And I grew up hearing about that because my mother is from Chittagong. So there's a, there was a certain point of pride about this. And then in doing research for Dust Under Her Feet, I discovered how, how instrumental Bengalis were in getting the British out and how we never actually stopped agitating. From the moment they entered, we tried to get them out. We were the group that, for 200 years, I mean, we were constantly, you know, agitating that this is a bad idea. We need them to leave as soon as possible. Um, so, 
but I feel like that's part of the Bengali blood to um, agitate. And uh, so I, I attended my first anti-Trump rally <laughs> um, a couple of weeks ago. It was a small group, it was in New York City. We marched to Trump Tower, we yelled, get him out. There was 50 people there. And How many Bengalis? <laughs> five, 10% <laughs> were Bengalis in New York City, Bengali Americans. Shens and Chattopadhyays and me and you know, it's just, it's just, and I started laughing. I was like, it's 1942 all over again. We, it, you know, and we were there and we were so angry and we were the loudest ones yelling, you know, because the fact of the matter is we're watching the U.S. fall apart, and we're vocal about this. So I just, I didn't. It's no coincidence that 10 percent of the demonstrators are of Bengali heritage. You are quite, uh, quite political in the sense that you're very vocal about your politics and you talk about it. And, um, you know, you have this situation in the U.S. which it, on the one hand is, is uh, you know, something you are uh, very, very actively protesting. Yeah. Uh, could you tell us a little bit from you know, your experience, what you are seeing today. I mean, we read all the time in the news, we see the news challenges, but, but you know, somebody, a writer especially, going through this kind of a, an experience, it is, it is outrageous. Yes. But what I find is a key difference, is that you are able to vocalize your outrage. Well, we in India seem do. to be interna interna internalizing our outrage. Well, in a large part. You guys are in a tough spot. <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't know how you're going to, I mean, a lot of, oftentimes your voices are silenced quite forcefully right now. So I'm not sure, I, I still feel like, um, you know, things are, you're, I still feel India as a country is processing everything that's happening, you know? So um, <coughs> the thing is, I ha being Bengali and being a writer, it's it's we, I'm automatically political. I do you know, it's in my blood. You know, it's in my culture. It was the way I was raised, and so uh, I, I, the way I'm vocalizing is this through my work. It's the most effective way. I'll go to the demonstrations and so on, but unless you're some VIP famous person, nobody's really gonna listen to you. You know, I, you know, I attended that demonstration, honestly, for my own well-being, for mm. my own mental health, so I don't feel like I'm not doing anything. So I don't feel like I'm sitting there while children are on the border of the United mm. States and Mexico in concentration camps and dying, mm. separated from their parents. I feel so much guilt you know, because I'm not doing anything. So that I did for my own personal edification, that I am going to protest. He's not my president. I didn't vote for him. I want him out. He's a fascist. And I, and I wanted to say that. But the most effective way is, is, I don't, work. is, is my work. That's my skill base. So, and that's what Bengalis do mm -hmm. through literature and art. That's how we express ourselves. Yeah, I think at, at some point it would be great also, you know, whether as part of this conversation or any other conversation, to talk about how sometimes art needs to be separated from commerce. Yes. Because yes, there is a need, and that there's a path where art and commerce do merge, and that's fine. Right. But there is also a space for the same artist operating in that ecosystem to at times separate art from commerce and say, this art is about a voice, yes, about having a voice. Yes. No, it's, it's, it's absolutely imperative. I mean, I understand the need for books that sell uh, and have mass market appeal. You know, I read also. I pick up, you know, I'm in traveling, I'm in the airport. I'll pick up something that's, you know, that's a little bit mindless and fun. I'm not going to sit there. I only read Dostoevsky and, you know, Rabindranath Tucker. No, of course not. <laughs> I'm gonna, I also read... You know, as a writer, I'm curious about a lot of things, you know. Um, I mean, I'm not going to read Twilight, uh, you know, things like that, because I don't, I don't want to be brain dead. But, <laughs> but, um, but definitely, there's a need to separate art and commerce. But if the two can meld, that's also wonderful. <laughs> Sharbury, it's been such a delight to speak to you. Uh, okay, you've, uh, been, you've been a lovely audience. Okay, uh, I, have a, uh, I have a request. Uh, I have a friend uh, along with me, and uh, he wants to ask you something. Yes. Lovely. I just want to buy you the short story book, okay. uh, uh, signed by you, oh. and 
and later on i read and and my give my comments and feedback to you oh that would be wonderful yes thank you so much thank you <laughs> if, if you have right now i don't i don't i only i think my only my novel is for sale here not my short but my short story collection you can get online okay. definitely on okay. amazon i think you can thank get you. it yes thank you uh, i think uh, uh, this friend deserves a huge huge round of applause oh. please yes thank you so much thank, thank you. you thank you thank you